Welcome to Compass Online. My name is Michelle, and I am involved at our Naperville campus. Thank you so much for joining us today. Will you do us a favor and fill out a connection card? You can add any questions or prayer requests on the card too. It's a great way for us to connect with you and maybe even get you plugged into our church family. The last couple of weeks, we've been showing you some videos from He Gets Us as we prepare for our next series. They've shown us how Jesus understands our desire to prioritize our families. They've also shown us how Jesus let his hair down. Y'all, he knew how to have a good time. Sometimes though, it's kind of hard to trust in things that we can't see. I remember meeting with a childhood friend of mine one day, and I had shared my faith with her countless times throughout our adolescence, but she was never quite interested. And at this particular meeting, she shared with me that despite her multiple attempts to reconcile, her marriage was ending. As we cried together, all I could think was, this was a God moment. I shared this thought with her, not because I was expecting her to accept Christ right at that moment, because I wanted her to know that God saw her even in her darkest times. I share this story with you because I'm not a super evangelist. I get scared and tongue-tied thinking about how to phrase things in just the right way so I can accurately relay how God has changed my life. I also think, though, that there's a lot of value in tangibly loving others, especially in times of brokenness. I remind myself that while I'm the one planting the seeds, God is the one who ensures growth. We're hoping this series will be a reminder to us all that Jesus is active in our lives, not only in the good times, but also when life is hard and heavy. In our next series, starting February 18th, we will see how Jesus also gets our anxiety, grief, and guilt. Let's take a look at one other one of these videos to see a little bit more of how he gets us. A young mother had a son, a kind-hearted boy who always tried to do what's right. As he grew older, he worried about others more than himself. Whenever he saw anyone suffering, he tried to heal and comfort them, but more people became sick. Disease ravished the land. People were quarantined, isolated. Many didn't survive. It became too much, and he had to isolate himself. He cried as he thought about all the unbearable things the people were going through. The mental anguish racked him with sorrow, but it was his cross to bear. looking forward to He Gets Us. I hope you're thinking about who in your life you'll be able to share that series with. In a minute, we're going to hear the next message from Jeff in our current series, Where We Met. But before we do that, let's prepare our hearts with worship. This is my Father's word.
Hey everybody, you know, before we dive back into our series, Where We Met, I got to tell you about something that I came across in my Bible reading this week. I have been in the book of Numbers. It's a book from the Old Testament. And I came across something I had never noticed before in chapter 7. Turns out that chapter 7 is a list of names. It's 12 guys I had never heard of. And specifically how much they gave to the cause of God in this precious moment. Let me, let me read the names. Uh, these are guys I just didn't know. Nashon, Nathaniel, Eliab, Elizer, Shelumiel, Elisha, uh, Elishama, Gamaliel, Abidon, Ahizer, Pagiel, and Ahira. Not only does it list their names, it says how much silver they gave, and gold, and produce, and livestock. So fascinating that their exact giving is recorded here in the Bible. Friends, what does that tell us about God? It tells us that he notices and that he remembers. I mean, this is over 3,000 years ago, and God to put it in the book. Let's never forget this act of generosity. And that's encouraging because many in our church have been generous, and the truth is <laughs> we forget I mean, we forget our own generosity. I, I wouldn't doubt if there are moments so decades ago when you were obedient to the Lord's leading and very generous and poof, you've forgotten it, but he hasn't. And friends, there are moments of generosity in the history of our church that our church has forgotten. I mean, we're like over seven decades old as a church. And there have been moments where people, many, have risen up and given and enabled our church to be what we enjoy today in the buildings that we enjoy today. And it's sad that we've forgotten those moments of generosity, but I'm here to tell you that God never will. In fact, when we get to heaven, the Lord's going to be like, you remember that generosity? And he'll be like, no, Lord, tell me. And he will celebrate what we've done because generosity is huge in the kingdom of God. In fact, one of the distinctives of God's people is to be generous, that we've grown to view our stuff as his stuff. And we've submitted ourselves saying, Lord, what would you have me do? And we hold it lightly and we give when he calls us to. And so the Compass Church has always been funded by a whole army of people who are generous givers, some giving to the benchmark of 10%, the tithe that God calls us to. And so I say thank you. Though we may forget, the Lord will never forget your generosity. And to those of you who are still growing in this area, I would say keep growing. Maybe you say, Lord, you're growing me in this and that arena, but generosity is one I still have not made progress in. May God guide you to steward and budget so that your life is marked by generosity to the cause of God as well. Folks, speaking about God never forgetting, let's go back in time, shall we? I want to show you something that happened 44 years ago. Friends, uh, this bronze statue captures an absolutely historic moment for downtown Naperville. This guy, this is Jim Mosier. He was a business owner of a shop in downtown Naperville, and he's presenting an idea to the mayor. And this idea changed everything for downtown Naperville. This moment happened in the late 70s, and in the 70s, this town in Naperville was a mess. Friends, there were shops going bankrupt, buildings emptied and dilapidated. It was just a, a disaster. Even the river was filled with trash, with junkyards coming right up to the riverbank. And this Jim Mosier had just been to Texas, specifically San Antonio, where he had seen their beautiful river walk. And he's back telling the mayor, Mayor, I'm telling you, it's a huge project, but if we built a river walk in Naperville, it would change everything for our town. Well, the mayor bought in and he said, let's do it. And it was in 1981 that the river walk of Naperville was completed. And, and Jim was right. It has been a game changer. It's kind of the crown jewel of the city of Naperville. In fact, when I was hired to this job uh, 10 years ago, I was interviewed 
here, uh, no kidding, an elder from our church. We walked on the river walk as he interviewed me and I was already sold on the church, but now I was sold on the town. I'm like, this is awesome. Friends, it's, it's been a blessing for those who love recreation. You've got walking, you've got swimming at Centennial Beach or boating at the paddle boat quarry. It was a win for those who love nature. So beautiful. I mean, the river, the trees, the grasses, the flowers. A win for those who love art. All throughout the Riverwalk, you'll find sculptures like this that are on display. Those who like history, we've got renovated historical buildings and We've got Naper settlements here. It's a win for those who love food. Over 50 restaurants right here. Those who love shopping. 100 shops have become quite the destination for, the, for those who like to shop. And so you talk about a turnaround. This river walk completely changed the trajectory of downtown Naperville from collapse to soaring. Some would say it is the cornerstone of the Naperville brand. Wouldn't it be nice if there were something like the Riverwalk? Just one thing that like solved all the problems in our lives. There is one thing that solves all the problems in our lives and it's not a Riverwalk. No, the solution for humanity is Jesus Christ. It's amazing how God has orchestrated things so that his son, Jesus, is the solution to the multifaceted problems in our lives. Jesus is the crown jewel for planet Earth. He is everything for those who realize it. And so in our series now, we've come to the front room. Uh, the front room of the tabernacle is filled with three pieces of furniture that proclaim the beauty of who Christ is for all who have come to see. And so let's dive deeper into our appreciation of the radical blessing that Jesus Christ is to us all. And let's do so by looking at the holy place, that is the front room, of the tabernacle. Folks, we are in the midst of studying the furniture in the tabernacle, which God designed and arranged. Remember last week we took a look at the courtyard, which had the altar where animals were sacrificed, and the wash basin. And what we learned is that if you want to get access to the inaccessible, it's all about what Christ has done. It's salvation through the shed blood of Jesus and the washing that makes it possible to be friends with God. And so now we're entering into the tabernacle building uh, itself and in the front room, which is called the holy place. And as it turns out, there are three pieces of furniture there. Let's, let's read about them, shall we? Exodus 40, starting in verse 22. Moses placed the table of the bread of the presence in the tabernacle along the north side of the holy place. And he set the lampstand across from the table on the south side of the holy place. And he also placed the incense altar in the holy place in front of the curtain. And so we're not only finding these three pieces of furniture, but we're finding where they were positioned in this front room. So got a little diagram here that shows a cutaway into the, the tabernacle building. You'll see the Ark of the Covenant in the back room. We'll look at that next week, but we're in the front room. And what we see up there is that, uh, what do we got first? We have the bread of the presence. That's this bread uh, set on a table that's along the, what was it, the north side. And then across from that, do you see the huge lampstand? And then also the incense altar was right in front of the curtain that concealed the Ark of the Covenant. So those three pieces, the table, the lampstand, and the incense altar, that's what we're going to be looking at today. And friends, I'll just tell you up front here, I'm going to make the case that all of these furnishings are a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. 
you know, as you walk into that, that tabernacle, what do you see? Well, you see the bread on the right and the lampstand on the left. You see bread and light. And what did Jesus use as some of the primary titles for himself? He says, I am the bread of life and I am the light of the world. And sure enough, uh, Christ was trying to show that, listen, this was all about me. Uh, foreshadowing the great blessing that the Messiah would be when he came. And so with that understanding, let's, let's start with that bread table, shall we? And I want to make the case that this shows us that Jesus provides satisfaction. Let me read Exodus 25, verse 23. It says this, make a table of acacia wood. Remember, these are the instructions of God. He is so detailed. Make it 36 inches long, 18 inches wide, and 27 inches high. Overlay it with pure gold and run a three-inch gold rim around the edge. Attach four rings to hold the poles that are used to carry the table. And so, once again, the uh, art professor at the Southern Illinois University has a sketch here that's helpful for us to imagine this table. And then in Leviticus 24, verse 5, we find that they are to bake 12 flat loaves of bread and place the bread before the Lord on the pure gold table. And so bread, friends, these uh, freshly baked loaves of bread were to be there in the tabernacle. It's interesting, the bread is called the bread of the presence, meaning the presence of God is right there. Or in some places it's called the show bread because God's showing himself. Or the bread of the face. You're meeting with the Lord face to face, dining right there with God. Well, let me show you what Jesus says in John 6, 35. It says, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. It's so interesting. Christ is saying, you know hunger, right? That ache inside that I am lacking. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And if you eat of me, you will find that hunger satiated, satisfied. What the image of bread is doing for us is identifying that all of us wonder what satisfies not only the stomach, but the soul. You see, God's the one who invented hunger. It's really an amazing thing. It's the body's craving, saying you are missing something. And there's a pain, if you will, within calling out for us to seek that which is needed. Spiritually, God's done the same thing. He's put a God-shaped void in the heart of every human being. And we all can identify with this ache of like, what am I missing? What is this all about? What's the point of life? And so people chase after various things that hopefully if I get successful or if I get the beauty or if I get the marriage I need or the kids I need or the house I need, hopefully these will satisfy when the teaching of scripture has always been that only the Lord satisfied, don't be misled by putting in things that are not the true bread of life. Jesus only satisfies. It's interesting, uh, St. Augustine once said, Lord, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Isn't that interesting? He's right. We were made for God. And without him, we're restless. We're hungry. We're angsty. We're like, oh, still have not found what I'm looking for. And, and Augustine says, we'll be restless until we find the one we were made for, until we find the Lord. And Jesus is the one who satisfies. You know, Augustine's story is fascinating. He lived long, long ago back. He was born in 354. AD. That's like 300 years after Jesus. And so this is a long time ago. He lived in North Africa, was born into a prestigious, relatively wealthy family. And he was just really bright, uh, started studying, went off to the greatest universities and flourished, became a college professor himself. But he was a, a non-believer. He was fleeing 
from the ways of God, diving deep into sin. He said that. He goes, for my 20s, the decade of his 20s, he was deep into sin, just abandoning the ways of God. And uh, sexually, alcohol, partying, theft, you name it, he did it. And everything he tried to fill the void within turned out to be disappointing. He became very prestigious, writing books at all the fame, all the women, all the booze, all the wealth. And he goes, I, I remained empty. And it was not until he heard the preaching of a Christian pastor named Ambrose that he, he, he goes, could that be it? And that got him into the Bible, particularly the writings of the Apostle Paul. And then Augustine, at the age of 31, had a radical conversion and just dove into this purpose for life, this life with Christ that he realized was what he was craving all along. And he wrote and became probably the most prominent theologian since the Apostle Paul himself. And he's the one who said, You've made me for yourself, O oh Lord. And the heart is restless until it rests in you. Who satisfies? Jesus is the bread of life, and only he will satisfy. Let's move on, shall we? The next is the lampstand. And I'm going to make the case that this shows that Jesus provides clarity. Shall we? Let's dive into Exodus 25, verse 31. God says, make a lampstand of pure gold. Make the entire lampstand and its decorations of one piece. The base, the center stem, the lamp cups, the buds and the petals. You see it's got a floral motif. Make it with six branches going out from the center stem, three on each side. And once again, take a look at this rendition, the artist's rendition of what this massive lampstand looked like. In fact, look at Exodus 25, verse 39. Uh, you will need 75 pounds of pure gold for the lampstand. This thing was a treasure. Friends, you know, gold is so expensive today. 75 pounds would be over $2 million in gold. So this lampstand wasn't like something you'd sit on the counter. It sat on the floor, and it was, it was huge. And the purpose of the lampstand was to illuminate that tabernacle. It was, it was, uh, there were no windows, and so sunlight didn't come in. It was the lampstand that made it so light reflected through the tabernacle. And Jesus was the one who spoke in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't stumble through the darkness, for light will flood your path. Isn't that beautiful? What is Christ getting at? Jesus says, without me, it's like you're stumbling around in the darkness. Life is confusing. You don't know which way is up or where to go. But Jesus says, I bring light that illuminates. And you're like, oh, I see what this is all about and where I need to go. Friends, this being stumbling in the darkness, it's a very common phenomenon for people to be confused, to say, what's the point of life? Who am I? Why am I here? What's it all about? And then with the coming of Christ, Jesus sheds light and brings clarity. Think about it. Jesus is the arrival of a rescuer, a savior to planet Earth. And all of a sudden, we begin to see the pieces come together. We're like, oh, wow, God is real, apparently. Look at he's just visited. And the earth is broken. It needs rescuing. That's why a rescuer has come. The, the, the earth is very broken. Things are not as they were supposed to be. And then we realize people are very valuable because of the rescue of Christ. If you come to rescue them, obviously they matter. You love them. See what we're developing? This is called a Christian worldview, where we understand and see things in light of Christ. And we realize Jesus has come to rescue us. Christ says, I am the only rescue plan to make things right with you and the Lord and to redeem the world. And then when we're right with God through Christ, Jesus says, the point of life is that you join me on my mission to bring restoration to the whole world. And instantly we've understood who we are, who God is, how to get right with him, the point of life. 
Things become clear when the light of Christ shines. And apart from that, it's just confusion. Kind of reminds me of uh, my wife and I sat down to watch a show on Netflix. It was an eight-episode mystery show. And I had been watching the first five episodes while I exercised on the treadmill. And so we were watching episode six, but Jen hadn't seen the first five episodes. So she was so confused. She's like, who's that? And why are they upset? And why are they going, running down the road? And she's asking me all these questions. And I was tempted to just say, darling, I'm trying to watch the show. Stop asking so many questions. But I guess I understand without the context, it just doesn't make sense. Who are these people and what are they striving to do? Well, I had the context that made the show quite delightful for me. See, how that's how it is with life. If, if you don't know the context, if you don't know who the Lord is and why things are as they are and what can be done with God and what the point of life, this life doesn't make sense. We are in, we're stumbling in the darkness and we will stumble in the darkness until we find Jesus, the light of the world. I'm going to light this oil lamp as just a reminder of that oil lamp that burned in the tabernacle and that Jesus is the light of the world. All right, let's take a look at the, the third piece of furniture and that is the incense altar which conveys that Jesus provides connection. We find this in Exodus 30, verse 1. It says, make an altar of acacia wood for burning of incense. Make it 18 inches square, 36 inches high, with horns at the corners. That's similar to the altar, the big one on the outside that had the uh, animal sacrificed on it. Overlay the altar with pure gold and run a gold molding around it. Make gold rings and attach them to the sides for the carrying poles. And once again, here's a picture, artist rendition of what this altar of incense looked like. It's interesting. The Lord specifies what the recipe for the incense should be. Incense is an interesting thing. It, can smell all different ways depending on what it's made of. And God said, I want the recipe for the tabernacle incense not to be used anywhere else. It's a delightful fragrance that's only for the tabernacle. The idea was that the smell of it, as people smelled it coming out, that they'd say, oh, it reminds me of the Lord. Uh, you know, odors, uh, aromas can really do that. In fact, when I uh, take a look at even this incense, Right away. It reminds me of India. I've been on mission trips to India many times, and they love the incense and uh, just the smell of it. It's like it brings me back to those adventures in India, which I, I love so much. So what, what does the incense mean? Well, incense, uh, well, it smells beautiful, but it also releases a smoke that rises up. And sure enough, the idea here is that our prayers go up to the Lord. It says in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, incense is the prayers of God's people. Uh, Psalm 141, verse 2, accept my prayer as incense. And so the idea of the incense going up is that it was always a picture of we are a people who connect through prayer to the Lord. Now, one of the things I find interesting is that in Exodus 38, it says Aaron must burn the incense continually. So the incense never stopped. They made sure it was always burning. And then look at 1 Thessalonians 5.17. It says, never stop praying. That perpetual incense that uh, burns is a symbol that we're always to be connected to the Lord. We can pray wherever we go. Now, Regarding this altar of incense, there's some information here that's really important. 
In Exodus 30, 10, it says, Aaron must purify the altar of incense by smearing its horns with blood from the offering made to purify the people. Remember on the altar on the outside of the tabernacle, that's where they put the animals that were sacrificed as a symbol of Christ dying on the cross? Well, they were to take some of that blood and smear it on the incense altar. In other words, the only reason that the prayers can be a connection to God is because of the blood of the sacrifice. Jesus makes prayer connection with God possible. Without Christ, there is no prayer connection with God. In fact, Christ taught as much. Three times, actually. We see Jesus teach this in John 14, in chapter 15, and chapter 16. Christ said, my father will give you whatever you ask, ask for in my name. You know, you may hear, you know, we pray, say, Lord, we, in your name we pray, amen. That goes back to the teaching of Jesus, that connection with God is only possible because of what Christ has done. Jesus is the one that enables us to connect with the Lord. Apart from Christ, there is no prayer connection, no relational delight. And we long to connect with God. The, the desire to know him and be known. The desire to love him and be loved. The desire to pursue him and him pursue us. The desire to fight for his cause and for him to fight for us. This is deep within us. We see it in our longing for connection with people. I, I have a guy in my small group, he just said something interesting. He's like, yeah, I'm coaching my daughter's basketball team, she loves it. You know, she's a young girl. He said, she doesn't love basketball that much, but she loves her dad being her coach. There's just something special. That girl, that young lady longs for the love and devotion of a dad. We all do. We, we watch romance movies because we long for, you know, feeling again the thrill of romance, being adored. Uh, we crave relational connection because it's an imperfect reflection of the ultimate connection that we long for, and that's God himself. We long, we were made to connect with God. So what, what have we seen here, friends? We, we've seen that Jesus, as, as the tabernacle indicates, he provides satisfaction, he provides clarity, and he provides connection to the Lord. He's everything. He's the game changer. He's the crown jewel of planet Earth. Remember the, the river walk in downtown Naperville? Just like downtown Naperville was a dump. It was collapsing, falling apart. The river walk changed everything, fixed everything, and made it thrive. Well, so Christ is the crown jewel of planet Earth. Without him, it's a mess. With him, <laughs> Jesus changes everything. Praise God for Jesus Christ. In fact, let's pray and thank him now, shall we? Lord, we are so grateful. In this moment of clarity, we realize, Lord, Jesus, without you, we are wandering, miserable in darkness and loneliness. In you, Jesus, you're it. You're the one who makes life satisfying and clear and you're the one who provides the connection that we were made for in prayer to the Lord and so Jesus we just want to say thanks thank you for changing everything you are our all and all we pray this in your name amen close to you Never let me go I lay it all down again To hear you say that I'm your friend You are my desire Will do.
Thank you for joining us today. There are so many things vying for your attention online, and we thank you for choosing to spend your time with us. We hope this service has challenged you and encouraged you. We also want to thank all of those who give to the Compass Church. Our mission here is to help people find and follow God. Everything we do here is focused on that. It's the faithful giving of so many of you that make it possible for us to do that. If you'd like to join all of those who give, Head on over to our website and find the many different ways you can do that. We look forward to seeing you next time as we continue our series, Where We Met, here at Compass Online.